Hello, and welcome to Badger Talk Lives, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Yi Yang, originally from the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Educational Achievement, also known as the DTEEA. And I'm a senior in the School of Human Ecology with a major in Human Development and Family Studies. I'm pleased to introduce John Lucy, the Director of Center for Dairy Research. Today, John will be taking us on a journey to explore how Wisconsin became one of the world's leaders in cheese production and how the University of Wisconsin has played a role in that transformation. John has a PhD in food science and over 20 years of research experience. As CDR director, he provides leadership to CDR staff to help CDR move forward and live up to its reputation as a world-class research center focused on application, outreach, and education. He is also a professor in the food science department and conducts research on the functionality of dairy foods. He has published more than 130 peer review articles and 20 book chapters. Please welcome Dr. John Lucy. Thank you, Yi. Let me get started. When we think about America's dairy land, um, we think about maybe farms with fields and barns. We might think about cheese heads. Um, we might think about cheese itself has been sold here. So where did this all come from? Where did this all get started? I wanna take you on a little journey today to talk a little bit about how that got started here in Wisconsin and then what role the university has played in this. And I think it's played a very active role as, as you'll see from, from, from my materials today. Cheese making dates back at least 7,000 years. At least that's as far back as we can track it, some uh, chemical testing of potteries and other charts. It traveled through Europe. The Romans then carried it to England as part of their empire. And then during the Middle Ages, it was very active in monasteries and monks across Europe where many of the major varieties such as Gorgonzola, Roccoforte came into being or being recognized as well as surface and smear ripened cheeses. And as the pilgrims came to the US on the Mayflower, one of the staple foods they brought with them was cheese. So why Wisconsin? Why did Wisconsin become a dairy area? That's the kind of question I'll try and pose at the first part of this talk. But I have two questions first that we should pose as we talk about this topic. If we look at the early years of Wisconsin, when it was becoming just becoming a state and into the 1880s, what was the major agricultural product produced here in the state in that period? And the second question, who were the major group of these first settlers? The answer to those questions is the major agricultural product was wheat. And the, the initial settlers here were what they were called Yankee farmers, but these were from New England and from the Northeast of the US. In the early years, wheat was big. And with wheat came mills and waterways to grind the, in, uh, the wheat into flour. And during those early years, including during the Civil War, the Wisconsin was considered the granary of the North and it supplied a lot of its flour and, and food for the North. And it was a bread basket. And here you can see some, some, some uh, harvesting of wheat. So why wheat? Why did wheat take off here in Wisconsin as the forests were being cleared? It was an important cash crop. So farmers could make money quickly off it, which is important as they were trying to struggling and, and surviving. It didn't require a lot of capital investment. It was fairly easy to grow. There wasn't any deep plowing required. You didn't really have to do a lot of tending for, for pests and other kind of things. It grew well. There was a good rate of return and it was a cheap way to farm and, and people needed it. They needed uh, flour and bread. And if you go around Wisconsin, you'll see lots of flour mills dotted around the landscape. And from about 1850, there was about 117 mills. But by the nearly 1880, uh, there was over 700 mills dotted all around the state. So there's a tremendous activity related to the wheat and flour mills around the state. Milwaukee became a major hub for this uh, growing wheat and flour industry. And you can see by 1890, it was, it was a hub for over 2 million barrels of flour. 
but if you look forward another 30 years or so, there was almost nothing coming from it. And it was using uh, both the, the railroads and other transportation hubs were coming out of Milwaukee. So what happened in those years that, uh, that wheat almost disappeared as a major crop here in Wisconsin? There were two major problems. One was insects and pests, especially these kinch beetles and bugs that really, uh, they were always here, but this monolithic type of wheat growing on the same land year in, year out, helped them to multiply and they decimated the crops and reduced the yield. And then the second thing is, as I mentioned, the farmers at that time thought it was a quick way to make profits or money. And they didn't spend a lot of, those early farmers didn't spend a lot of time looking after the land. The soil got depleted and yields decreased. Those farmers, uh, those initial farmers moved out west as the plains opened up and they um, started to grow their wheat and other crops in those areas and moved out of Wisconsin. And the new immigrants, the new wave of immigrants starting from the 1950s, 1960s on, they tended to be more European. And they came from Switzerland, Germany, Norway, French, Italian, Dutch, et cetera. And they came and settled here in, in Wisconsin. They brought different traditions and skills that they came from their homeland. And one of them we'll see related to dairying and cheese making. And for example, we can see populations of, for example, Swiss in places like Green County, for example, and they, they brought their um, traditions and quickly started to do what they used to do in their own homeland. They built barns. They, they looked after their cattle. They recognized mining the land and manure and fertilizing the, the land, rotating the crops. They had feed crops they could sell and they brought dairy breeds to Wisconsin specifically to produce milk rather than just be for um, a lot of times minimal amount of milk from the previous cattle and a lot of them were used for pulling and so on uh, and hauling. So if you look at the growth of dairy cows within the state by 1867, so just after the Civil War, there was about 245,000 uh, cattle or cows here. Um, and many of those were not very uh, high producing animals. If you look forward to, to 1912, we had over nearly a million and a half cows here in the state. So a massive increase in the number of cow numbers. And they peaked somewhere around the Second World War in terms of cow numbers. And it was over two, probably two and a half million cows here in the state of Wisconsin. One thing I wanted to, um, to add in there, and I just looked up the stats for it, the average output for cow in 1940 was about, on a year basis, was over 6,000 pounds. I, I looked up the numbers for 2018, where we had nearly half as many cows, 1.2 million cows here in the state of Wisconsin, but they were now producing 24,000 pounds. So a three plus fold increase um, in, the, in the amount of output per cow. And that's really due to the massive advances in genetics and also management and nutrition, et cetera, that's happened in this time. William Dempster Horde is considered the father of American daring. And like many people in the daring story, originated or lived in New York before coming to Wisconsin. And he migrated here to Wisconsin and um, started to live and around Fort Atkinson here in the southern part of the state. So Horde was an interesting character. He had grown up on a farm in New York and had uh, attended herds, etc. And he saw the decline of wheat and he thought, what a disaster for the farmers here in the state and how could they become prosperous and, and care for themselves and their families. And he thought that wheat was, was on the way out and that he thought daring was a much more sustainable long-term and suitable thing to do here in Wisconsin. And he advocated strongly for it. And he had a vision that Wisconsin could become a strong daring state and you'll see in the next slide, he actually set up a couple of papers, one newspaper and one um, 
agricultural journal and he used this uh, as a newspaper publisher he used this to educate and also to advocate and he went around the state advocating that farmers should consider to substitute the cow for what they've been using at the plow at the back so that was his slogan substitute the cow for the plow and really this and many other uh, he organized uh, dairying associations and he, he eventually became uh, governor of the state of wisconsin he was an all-around kind of um, very entrepreneurial type of guy as well this hordes dairyman was a magazine focused specifically on giving relevant technical information to the dairy farmers and it was published routinely and became one of the most influential agricultural journals in the nation and actually i would say in the world and it talked a lot about how to mine cattle what to do and feed uh, and, and the latest and greatest in technologies or equipment was in there and that was one where he actively used to speak at many meetings and became an advocate and a very strong advocate for agriculture here in the state so although we were producing milk and dairy why cheese why focus on cheese here in the state a couple of issues raw milk as produced by the cow when it um, is really very limited shelf life it'll spoil pretty quickly lots of bacteria can spoil it and <clears throat> it's really not got a lot of refrigeration at that time so really it, you very little chances pasteurization had not yet been invented in that last uh, in that period of time so cheese became a natural way to preserve it or ferment it into a product. And this fermentation is a natural fermentation by bacteria that were present on the farm, on the cows, and, and therefore in the milk, and they produced lactic acid, and that allowed you then to cut it or coagulate it and remove some of the water. So you concentrated it, and then with all this acid, and you could add salt, you could make a product that could last literally for years. So well, the shelf life of raw milk was literally hours, maybe a day or so before it spoiled or went sour. You could get years of nutritious uh, product out of something like cheese. So that allowed Wisconsin to think about where it could ship its products, not just worrying about feeding your own family, which would be raw milk. Up until about the 1840s and start of 1950s, cheese making really was something that was done at the farm it was truly a farmstead operation and there were lots of reasons for that one was storage issues that we just talked about where are you going to store this milk there was very um, there was no refrigeration the only thing you could do is put, put if you had a river or stream nearby put a churn or a tank into the water and hope that the water temperature would help cool the milk temperature was a traditional way of doing it but no no sophisticated way of cooling your milk and without cooling, it rapidly spoiled. The second issue was transportation, lack of roads, lack of really paved roads or any kind of organized roads and roads to cities were, were really difficult and took a long time. And railroads started to come into being obviously around this time and become more widespread. So it became opportunities for you to get it onto a railroad stop, put it on a car and ship it to a city or an urban population center. And obviously cheese making too needed some of the technology side, you know, equipment uh, was very, very much um, rudimentary type of equipment. Some people in historical things use potteries and wood implements and things like that. So very little control, very little sophistication. That started a change in the coming decades. So the, the start of American cheese making plants is a little bit when you talk about when did these first plants come about, it depends on how you define a cheese factory or a cheese plant. Um, one, one type of plant that first started was this famous one by Ann Pickett and it's out of Lake Mills. And that was the first time recorded time where she collected milk from neighboring farms or her neighbors and pooled them and used it to make cheese on her farm. So she already had, was making cheese on her own farm and she just took of our neighbor's thing. So in a sense, that's the first where you go outside your own individual separate farm and start to make cheese. And so that, that's one way to look at the first cheese plant. Probably a more recognizable 
uh, definition of a cheese factory to the modern way of looking at it is a factory concept where it's built away from the farm itself. So this was the first factory that did not be, was not part of a farm. It was built separate from everything else. And it just received milk from cows from various customers or suppliers, just like a modern plant would do now. This was very controversial at the time. Many people laughed at it and called it Hazen's folly and really thought this was the silliest thing ever and would not succeed. But boy, did it succeed. And this is the model for most cheese plants now are, are this kind of central model of receiving milk from patrons. Started with only 100 cows, but quickly, rapidly grew. And he, then he started to ship this outside the state and build more factories, including some in conjunction with people like Horde. Let's look at a few cheeses that popped up that were, we can say are Wisconsin types of cheeses. One of the first recognizable ones that are from Wisconsin is something called Brick. And it was formed uh, or uh, developed in around Watertown by a man called John Josie. And it was really, if you see here, he's holding a brick in his hand. And it was a way to place a brick on top of a mold to press the cheese curd. And by pressing it with this weight of a brick, it lose, lost a little bit more water or moisture and made a slightly different kind of product than the previous ones, which were unpressed. Uh, it was similar in style to Limburger, which was all the rage at the time. But it was a, a different product because it was more firmer with lower moisture. And that product was called Brick. And that's still made today in many parts of Wisconsin. Slightly different technology than the bricks, but the same type of approach in terms of its composition and characteristics. Colby from Colby, Wisconsin, uh, was, was similar to cheddar cheese, but either by accident or design, they actually added water or washing step in the middle of the cheese making process. This washing step removed some of the sugar or lactose and made a milder, sweeter type of cheese that was also a little bit more open. That means it was a little bit more crumbly uh, type of texture. And that was the start of Colby, which is very popular to many people because of its mildness compared to maybe the strong acid taste of something like cheddar. Another cheese that truly didn't originate completely in Wisconsin, but got significantly modified into a different kind of version would be, would be something like low moisture part skim mozzarella. So what I mean by that is um, historically mozzarella was, was a cheese that had been around for many uh, centuries and very often made from water buffalo. So that's a very high fat milk and it would be high moisture, soft kind of fresh. It would be more like what would fresh mozzarella would be today if we went to the store. In Wisconsin, as they started to get into the production of various cheeses, um, cheese makers here in the state also wanted to start making mozzarella, but they were worried about its ability to be shipped and to be, have good shelf life, and then to be shredded or grated and used in pizzas in places like New York or the East Coast. So at the university, Professor Samus worked on taking out some of the fat from the milk. So making it a part skim, so partly fat reduced and reducing some of the moisture content. Both of those made a little bit firmer product that was easier for cutting and slicing and shredding and also extended to shelf life and had the other bonus of allowing the farmers or the manufacturers to take some of that excess cream and make some butter on it. And that kind of product now is made around the world as the dominant type that is used to make uh, are used on pizzas in most countries of the world. So I wouldn't say truly we didn't discover or create the recipe for mozzarella here, but boy, did we change it into something that's unrecognizable from the original mozzarella, uh, the fresh mozzarella that was made prior to that. And the last one I want to talk about is um, Kojak or Colby Jack. It was developed here nearby us here in Arena uh, Cheese in Arena, Wisconsin. And it's a mixture really of Colby and Monterey Jack are a colored and uncolored similar style cheeses. And by combining them, you get this kind of mottled look and it's a very popular cheese and very interesting cheese. And, and there are other cheeses that are made in other parts of the US that have these kind of mixture type products as well, uh, but a very interesting type of product. 
So I said that that's kind of a, a little bit of the history, but I know I want to, as, as we go into it, but I also want to kind of delve into talking a little about, about the role of UW-Madison in this development. And again, I'm going to ask a question here, you know, the dominant dairy and cheese state, if you look at the period from about 1850 to 1910 was, and it was not Wisconsin, just want to give you a kind of a cheat here, it's not Wisconsin, the dominant dairy state at that time was New York. And New York, why? Um, at that time, huge population centers all around New York, obviously New York City and other areas. And the farming was basically designed to be close to urban centers and cows and herds had to be close to urban centers because of the shelf life issues for, for, for fresh fluid milk, as we talked about. And so the dairy industry grew very strong here and had been going on there since the early days of the colonists arriving here in the US. And so dairy was very strong in New York. And, and why I brought that up was, is that many of the influential dairy leaders that really set Wisconsin to be uh, the dairy state really came from or had lived previously in New York. So they were really influenced either by birth or by working there, for example, at Cornell and other universities or owning farms there and from New York. So really we owe um, a big debt um, in terms of um, bringing some of that skills and knowledge here to the, to the dairy state as it got out from New York. We already talked about Horde and Hiram Smith is another person that we'll come across as well. And Henry uh, was the first, I'll, I'll mention he'll be, he'll be the first professor of ag here in the college. Stephen Babcock came up with the famous Babcock test. And then Walter Price was our cheese guru in the first half of the last century and trained others, including Norm Olson. And really that helped us in terms of the knowledge uh, a base in terms of cheese manufacturer ripening and quality is considered one of the, the overall gurus of uh, in, in terms of cheese making. So if you look at some milestones related to dairy or ag development here related to UW, you had in, in 1880, Henry came from Cornell, as we mentioned, the New York connection, hired as the professor of agriculture and actually, I think he also had, uh, had an, an additional thing in his title, botany. Uh, and I believe he was hired by Bascom, President Bascom at that time, and really came in to look at the get agriculture going here in the state. And also, um, one of the things he tried to do earlier on is to look after feed for the animals and look at silos where you would put feed into a pit, cover it up and seal it up and allow a fermentation to go on to it. And that would preserve almost like a fermenting like a sauerkraut or something like that would preserve the feed during the winter time and have it available to feed the animals in the winter time because prior to that there wasn't a lot of feed in the winter apart from hay and really the farmers stopped milking their cows in that period when there wasn't outdoor pasture he was very instrumental of working with um with uh, Hiram Smith uh, to get the UW experimental station opened and by 1889, the College of Ag had been formed, now, now not just the departments, but it had been a College of Ag, and he was the first dean of that college. And he worked with Hiram Smith, who was a very active uh, cheesemaker and dairy ag association person, and also he became a regent. And as part of the regent, he was really uh, the first farmers part of the UW Reg Board of Regions and very active in terms of promoting ag and ag community here and very influential working with people like Henry to really promote that on the campus. As a result, they hired Stephen Babcock out of Cornell again as a professor of agricultural chemistry. That would be close to kind of biochemistry now, but that wasn't a term that was yet available. And a couple of years later, he came up with his famous Babcock test, which measured the amount of fat present in milk. And really this seems pretty simple, but without being able to measure that, it, there's no way to really make a very well-defined or concrete process for anything. If you don't even know how much fat is in there, it was the first kind of major breakthrough in being able to say, we need X amount of fat. Are we very efficient? How, many, uh, how much fat do we need to make butter or cheese and standardize those processes? 
It also had the effect of helping to fix if there was any adulteration, if farmers were adding water to the milk, because the fat content would go down. So it really, um, in many parts of the world, he's considered kind of the Thomas Edison, basically, of dairying, because of his revolutionary inventions. In 1890, the first dairy school was opened here at UW-Madison, and the first dairy school was opened here on campus, and we've had one continuing for the last um, 130 plus years in some shape or form on this campus. When a permanent uh, dairy um, building was built in 18, or started in 1890, it was called Hiram Smith Hall, basically in recognition of the, the vocal advocacy from Hiram Smith in terms of getting ag and dairy going here on campus. And here's just some pictures of the, some of the students in these classes uh, as they were trained in how to make dairy products and manufacturing and so on. Wisconsin's dairy industry rapidly grew. And by around uh, 1910, became the leader in cheese production and really was helped a lot by refrigerated rail cars where Wisconsin could put their cheese into these refrigerated rail cars, allowing its cheese to be shipped to the East Coast rather than have to put it in um, horse and buggies or other kind of uh, transportation. This was rapid and fast and allowed them to stay cool. And by 1915, Wisconsin had passed New York to become the leading dairy state. And the title it held until California passed it in terms of milk volume production, I believe in the 1960s. One of the things Wisconsin did is that because it was coming to this after some other states like New York, is Wisconsin industry, both the university, the state, and um, the cheesemakers themselves, really were very adamant that they would be seen as producing very high quality products. And they demanded and put in place rigorous standards and licensing to produce our manufactured dairy products, such as, for example, requiring every person who made a cheese to have a, a cheese making license. And we're the only state to do that. It also introduced mandatory grading. So to see what kind of quality products you're producing and see if it passed uh, acceptable standards. Otherwise you could buy a cheese and it may be actually awful or bad tasting or have a defect. But grading was a way to standardize that so you knew what you were buying. And again, introducing more confidence in buyers and the consumers in our products. And a very serious thing uh, here in Wisconsin. And I think that's continued that philosophy of focus on quality and, and putting in steps in place to maintain that quality, including training as I'll get to in a second. In those coming decades after uh, daring got established and advocated, as I said, by people like Horde and others, um, you could see the growth in the number of cheese plants here peaked around 1920, 1922. And we had just a little bit shy of 3000 cheese plants dotted all over the state. And literally they were all small operations. They, there's a saying there was one at every crossroads in some parts of the state. And basically they were everywhere, but they were small. And what you had then over the coming decades is those small ones were rationalized into bigger ones and rationalized again into bigger ones and bigger ones. And you had this consolidation. And, and now we're down to about in cheese plants down to around 120 or a little bit over 120 cheese plants here in the state of Wisconsin. And it's kind of leveled off right now uh, in terms of numbers, not decreasing much more, but not adding that much more either. At the same time, although the number of plants was going down, cheese production was skyrocketing. And I'll talk about a little bit of those coming up in the next slide. So although we had fewer plants, the plants were bigger and more cheese would be made. By 1970s, we've topped a billion pounds of cheese being produced in the state. By 1992, we passed 2 billion pounds produced in the state. And by 1919, we had over 3 billion pounds produced in the state from our milk. So you can see cheese production, which coincides with milk production, since about 90% of our milk goes into cheese, has, has continued to grow and grow, even though the number of plants have gone down. So it was not just at the farm that these developments were, were affecting, it was also at the plant level as well. And if you look forward to today, um, the impact on the state of Wisconsin is tremendous. 
it generates um, about 45 plus billion dollars in, uh, in economic impact to the state, something that's calculated in conjunction with UW extension from time to time. And we're obviously the um, most farms still left in the US and there's gone down tremendously. We have about 7,000 farms, I think at the moment in, in Wisconsin, we've been losing them at a rapid rate the last couple of years. And I believe around 1960, we had about 100,000 farms here in the state of Wisconsin. So the, the decline has been very rapid in the number of farms. Those farms have got larger. And I think in the last uh, Badger Live Talk, Mark Stevenson talked a lot about that consolidation process. Our, our cow sizes in terms of in a farm are small relative to other states like California or Idaho and so on. But 95% plus, plus of our farms are still very much family owned farms. We produce a lot of cheese. And if you look at um, just classifying Wisconsin as a country rather than the state, you could see it will be the fourth largest cheese producing country, if you want to use that terminology, in the world just by looking at its production stats. It would, US would still be number one behind Germany, France, and then Wisconsin. So massive amount of cheese produced here in the state. But it's not just about quantity. It's also uh, fair to say quality is very, very high. In the last world cheese contest uh, held in 2020, Wisconsin took away 45 gold medals. So this is the Olympics for cheese contests. The nearest next country, and I'm using the word country here, including Wisconsin, and I know it's not a country, uh, was Netherlands with 10. And we took over 120 total medals from that competition. So amazing record of high quality products produced in all kinds of categories and styles of cheeses. And we make so many different styles here in the state of Wisconsin. It's amazing. So coming back to the modern era and uh, the impact of UW, we, we all are probably familiar with the Wisconsin idea uh, exposed by ex-president Van Heys in the early uh, 1900s, 1904, that the boundaries of the campus are the boundaries of the state. Really what this said is we should, as and I'm a professor here for 22 years, we should as professors also worry about the impact that our work could have on the people of Wisconsin, not just the students that are in our class. How can we help them as well? And that basically is a lot about extension, but also as faculty, we have a responsibility to help our state and move it forward. So the, I wanna talk a little bit about, last part, about the Wisconsin Center for Dairy Research. And really we focus on helping grow the cheese and dairy industry here in the state. And it's a partnership with our dairy farmers here in the state. Started in 1986 as a partnership with the Milk Marketing Board here in Wisconsin. And it was a brainchild of food science professor, Norm Olson. And CDR now has over 40 staff. It started with three and has grown tremendously in that time. And it's primarily funded or supported by dairy farmer, our industry. If you look at the number of companies they work with, they work with over 350 companies groups every year and that seems to be growing. They continue this, uh, uh, this tradition here in Wisconsin and at UW of training the industry and they train over a thousand employees on cheese making and uh, pasteurization and other dairy manufacturing techniques every year. And a very impactful uh, way that they've affected um, our industry here is the Wisconsin Master Cheesemaker Program was established here in 1994. There's lots of different areas that the CDR works within. We mentioned training already. They do applied research, have graduate students. They do a lot of process development. I'm going to talk about some examples in specialty cheese. And they do a lot of troubleshooting with our um, cheese plants and dairy plants around the state to help them with defects or qualities or other kind of issues that they're having. They run the Master Cheesemaker Program. And I'm going to end up today talking a little bit about how they promote dairy startups and entrepreneurs. 
The CDR doesn't make any products for sale. It's unlike Babcock Dairy, which is our university creamery. Uh, the CDR doesn't make any products or sell any products. What they do is they train people who go on to win contests. And if you look back to that world um, cheese contest, which actually had other categories beyond cheese, um, CDR trained or had people in classes from the winners of over 60% of all product category winners had come to our short courses. So we like to think we played some role by our training and skills in helping them become winners. Specialty cheese is something I just wanna focus on here because it's been a big change in the last 30, 40 years here in the state of Wisconsin. So what is specialty cheese? Typically, we say that is something that is limited in production for some reason. It's not your commodity type products. And it might have unique features. And there are various ways we can talk about unique features. It could be just the color of it looks different, the flavor, the shape, the appearance, what type of milk was used. All kinds of things can go into it, uh, defining it as a specialty cheese category. In short, there's been nothing short of a revolution in our Wisconsin industry in the past 30, 40 years. We went from making commodity products, basically a small number of them too, cheddars, mozzarella, cottage cheese, Swiss, et cetera, and then starting to diversify in a broad, broad range of blue cheeses, feta, asiago, all kinds of interesting uh, styles and types of cheeses in the intervening time. And really this is part of necessity too, because plants, big plants, modern plants that could undercut them in cost were being installed in all kinds of places like California. And if Wisconsin didn't diversify into value added rather than just a race to the bottom in terms of price, we would have lost most of our plants. If you go back to the early 1980s, before the center even got started, we were already on staff working with Norm Olson, we're already doing projects on specialty cheese. And these projects were to, de were to develop specialty cheese recipes and products. The first was Dutch Casa, which basically is aged uh, uh, Gouda cheese, which is still made here at Babcock Hall and has been a very award-winning cheese for it. But many other cheeses were done and developed in projects that were funded by dairy groups or farmer groups or milk marketing groups. By the early 1990s, a program with staff and resources was started to do specialty cheese development here at the CDR. And as part of that program, the Wisconsin Master Cheese Program was created. And we also put in place curriculum for artisan courses. You can see by today, about half of all specialty cheese products in the US are made here in Wisconsin. I repeat, half of all specialty cheese made in the US are made here in Wisconsin, and it's over 800 million pounds. How did that happen? The training that occurs at the CDR and at the UW has focused on exposing our cheesemakers to all kinds of specialty products that are made around the world, in particular from Europe. And how that is done is every year there's a brand new short course that is done using a different part of Europe, whether it's Italy or Spain or Switzerland or in Scandinavian countries or wherever. And typically the model there is to bring in trainers and staff and experts from schools in those countries, bring them here for a short course, and they talk to and make cheese with our cheesemakers. And we put a, a curriculum around that for a couple of days to expose our cheesemakers to new insights and new ideas to broaden their horizons. That broadening of their horizons has allowed our cheesemakers here in the state to now produce over 600 styles and types of cheeses. And as we saw earlier on, high quality products as well. The Master Cheesemaker Program is the only one of its kind in the US. And it's really meant to supplement the tradition and art and craft that our cheesemakers have here in the state of Wisconsin and they're outstanding cheesemakers. But take the best of the best, the cream of the crop, if you like, and elevate them through this program. To get entry to the Master Cheesemaker Program, you need to be making cheese here in the state of Wisconsin for 10 years. And so there's also very strict entry requirements in terms of you have to pass an exam that shows that you really understand the science of cheesemaking. Those who become master cheesemaker programs can use a master's mark or a logo, which many retailers look for in terms of high quality cheese. So when you talk about specialty cheese development, they've hit the big time. 
we see books, newspaper articles, TV interviews, calendar shoots, etc. These guys have hit the big time in terms of the specialty cheesemakers here in the state of Wisconsin. Let me just give you a couple of uh, examples of some of those um, specialty cheese makers. And the most winningest cheese here in the, in the US is Pleasant Ridge Reserve that is made by Uplands Cheese. And here in the photo you see on your left is Mike Gingrich who founded it and Andy Hatch who's took over the business. They won three best of shows. Nobody else has ever won three best of shows at the American Cheese Society meeting. They've also won US contest and many other awards that I didn't put out here. This cheese often retails for over $30 a pound. It's highly sized, made from grass-based milk, and they are out of, um, down by Dodgeville. Crave Butters is a different one. It's a, it's a family business where they have cows on the farm and they produce milk uh, from those cows, obviously, and produce their cheeses, such as fresh mozzarella, mascarpone, and some other styles and types on their farm. But it's a very large farm. And um, CDR has been actively involved in helping create some of the recipes for them as well, just like it was for Pleasant Ridge Reserve. Raleigh cheese, Chris Raleigh is a small operation uh, here near Schulzburg. And really we're, we're talking about an Alpine style cheese. And he has been um, one best of show at the American Cheese Society in 2016. I want to end by talking a little bit about the CDR facility. You can see on my um, screen here behind that we have the CDR facility is under construction. If you walk by Babcock Hall, uh, a brand new facility, a total project cost is going to be around $72 million with this and the renovation of the Babcock dairy plant. And for us, we're super excited because when this new building, we'll have lots of brand new facilities and equipment including nine caves to make specialty cheese. And I, I talked a lot about specialty cheese and how Wisconsin has become a king of it and leader in it. Uh, we're also doing things like shelf stable milk beverages rather than need to put them in the refrigerator. These would be heated and processed and packaged in such a way they wouldn't need to go in there. So it would be long shelf life products. A couple of years ago, Emmy Roth with their grand crew won the um, uh, top award at our cheese contest with a cheese made in a copper vat. So it's very unusual type of flavor that can be made from these products. And we are installing one here just so we can experiment and help people as they develop the next versions of cheeses. We also have small versions of the full industrial enclosed vats that you see in modern plants to allow people to train or experiment on this. And we also make a lot of powders from whey and other products. And we are installing a brand new milk powder dryer here. So really a broad range of different products and techniques that can be um, made in our brand new CDR facility. In passing, I should mention that we do also have a very active program to support entrepreneurs in the dairy space in partnership with our Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. And we have a whole website on it if you want to look at it. This is a program funded by the USDA, and it has various buckets of activities that we do across the five state region here in the upper Midwest. It does regional seminars talking about how to start a dairy business and what lessons learned and what kind of things they should do. It provides technical assistance to entrepreneurs and startups and struggling businesses. And then half of the funding we receive each year from USDA goes and grants to business. And we just announced a million dollars in grants to 26 companies across our region this past week to help people buy equipment, get started or do marketing. Again, we're focused on the small guys because who knows, in a couple of years, these could be big players and they help their local uh, uh, groups. So in terms of wrapping up, Back to my question at the start, why did Wisconsin become so successful at dairying? These, this is just my take on it. I think we had great soil, climate, et cetera. It was very suitable for producing uh, milk and dairy. You had immigrants that came in with skills and passion in dairying and cheese making, and they continued that tradition. And I think you've, I've tried to highlight in my talk today, lots of great partnerships have gone in the state between the farmers, the universities, uh, industry, the state. And I think there's also a lot of can do entrepreneurship and activities that really are, are very strong within our industry to come up with new kind of methods and techniques for making cheese. So I think all of that combined made an explosive package here in the state to very successful dairy state. 
So I'd like to thank you for your attention today. And over to you again, Fran, and I'll happy to try and answer any questions if I can. Great, thank you, John. So, so interesting and such an important piece of our celebration of June Dairy Month here with the work you're doing. Uh, hello everyone, Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. Feel free to post your questions in the chat if you have any for John. Uh, so question for you, one thing that I'm uh, intrigued by is obviously the heavy focus on cheese. And I actually had the good fortune of attending the 2020 World Cheese Championships, John. I didn't even know of all the huge affiliation we had with that event and all that information. Um, tell me a little bit about your, I know you have a background, an international background. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because we didn't hear a lot about your background and how that sort of informs the work that you're doing in the CDR. Good question. Um, so uh, you probably wouldn't have guessed, but uh, I grew up in a farm, <laughs> a dairy farm in Ireland. Um, my brother took over running that family farm a number of years ago. It was small. We had about 30 or 40 cows. Um, and one of the things that I used to do in the summers is actually I, there was a nearby milk powder plant. We didn't have a nearby cheese plant, but I used to work in my summers in a, in a milk powder plant, watching all aspects of how it was made. So when I went to school, I really wanted to figure out where, where does milk that left our farm went to and why did they make these different products? So I went into food science and uh, continued to do a PhD in food chemistry to really understand what are happening in these kind of products and was fortunate enough to enter um, to become a researcher. So I went for work uh, at the Irish Dairy Institute, kind of, so it's like CDR, but there's one for Ireland. And um, actually had some time after that, I spent a year in Holland and then four years in New Zealand. All, all great dairying countries, by the way, was, was probably the connection to it. And one fun fact for you, I, I did work on developing my own cheese. It's called Dubliner. And if you go to the store, when I was in Ireland, that was one of the products I was involved in. And um, that's made commercially now in, the, in, the, in Ireland and actually exported now to the US. You'll see it in some stores here. Fantastic. And boy, uh, at the competition, there is a lot of pomp and circumstance. There's definitely ceremony around all of the judging. And I happen to also have the good fortune of working in the building where the competition was housed. And every day they would put like extra cheese out so people could just randomly kind of come in and observe all of the judging and everything and then sample fantastic cheeses. So um, just a, just an FYI, people of the state, like watch uh, the internet for when that competition comes around because it is a lot of fun, even if you're you know, not knowing anything about cheese, they welcome everybody coming through. So that was- Yeah, I, they're all passionate about cheese, um, irrespective of which state they come from, which country they come from, they're all passionate about cheese and quality of cheese. And they have, obviously they all have their own um, favorites in terms of styles and types, but they're all dying to tell people about what this cheese is like and flavors. <laughs> so I think it's a, it's a fun thing if you're into it. I mean, it's a bit like wine. There's a lot of complexity and a lot of different varieties and a lot of complexity in terms of why this should taste this way. So I think that's a fun way to learn it and just taste lots of different varieties if you haven't experienced them in the past. Uh, an amazing undertaking taken on. I have to give a plug for the Wisconsin cheesemakers that put that on for many years and do a fantastic show uh, every time. We supply a number of judges. Again, I think we're a good place to supply judges to a, a number of judges to it um, because we don't make any products. So we are kind of um, independent, you know? So we just look at what, who's producing good quality products. That kind of piggybacks on my next question. Is there a public component or access uh, for the new building that you're doing? Will there be some sort of public access area or not really? Is it really meant for students and people earning certifications? Well, I, I one of the things we are putting into um, some of the key production areas is actually cameras. So we can zoom in on different parts of the process and then we can show it in our auditoriums for various groups or meetings or come in there as well. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to bring large groups of kids or large groups of publics into a processing area where you're making cheese, just from a food safety point of view. But one of the things we, we really thought about as we were doing this, because it's a very complicated project, we thought about how we could show the actual manufacture of these products to people. And I think that's one of the ways we're going to do it. We're going to have cameras literally in those spaces so people can, can see it. And 
and the Babcock Dairy, the Babcock Dairy, the University Creamery still will have an observation area overlooking making ice cream and things like that. So that will continue once that renovation is finished, probably be next year. So we still want people to come and see where dairy products are made. There's so few places around the state where that really can happen these days that I think it's important for people to see where their milk and dairy comes from and their food comes from just in general. That's one last question I had. So obviously the focus is largely on cheese and of course milk, and we understand the, the transportation and storage issues with milk, but what, where the heck is ice cream? Like everybody eats tons of ice cream and it didn't really even land in sort of the major production item. So what's the story there? Well, as you probably know, Babcock ice cream is, is trusted and valued and appreciated by, by our, our, our people on, on campus and all our alumni as well. And so that, that will be a feature of our renovated plant as well. But I, I think ice cream in general is a very important product across the U.S. and U.S. eats a lot of ice cream. So uh, there's a lot of innovation that goes into actually on campus in our building. There's an ice cream center as well, and they do helping people um, on ice cream and they do courses every year year and they actually have courses just for small batch ice cream so they would be more the entrepreneurial style uh, style people so they do courses just for those people that make small batches of all kinds of uh, interesting flavors. Uh, it was fun to be around the, the building at that time because they make all kinds of nice flavors and they don't use it all in the courses. So we get a chance to sample some of those as well and all kinds of new flavors as well. So that's that's a cool. So I think it's an important theory. People love it. Uh, people eat a lot of it here in the U.S. And that's a, a core part of our building as well in Babcock Oil. Just a small perk of the job, I'm sure, John. Small perk. We get cheese. There's, only, <laughs> we, there's a lot of cheese floating around our building, usually for tasting and, and just uh, evaluating as well. But it's not all hard work, as you can see. Excellent. Well, John, thanks so much for joining us today and telling us more about the Center for Dairy Research. Great work. We appreciate your sharing with us today. You're welcome. And, and just, just uh, you know, as you said, June Dairy Month, and it's also nice to just put a little bit of color on what the campus has done to help the dairy industry as well. I think it's been a true partnership over those last 100 plus years. Thanks so much. Everybody, we're going to be wrapping up our celebration of June Dairy Month next Tuesday uh, with uh, June 29th at noon. We're going to be talking to Courtney Halbach from the Dairyland Initiative. And she's going to be talking about how dairy farmers are optimizing cow comfort and welfare through the design and lameness prevention based on recommendations from her team. So a very different perspective. We're not going to be talking about product, but we're going to be talking about how cows are cared for and the facilities they're designing to, uh, to help with that. So please tune in. As always, visit badgertalks.wist.edu where you can see our upcoming schedule of talks. You can sign up for our email list. Please consider a donation. Badger Talks is supported by a grant from the Alumni Association. You can also look, uh, search our website. We have over 400 faculty and staff that are signed up to give talks around the state virtually and in person soon. So please visit our website. And as always, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great day.